Good afternoon. With me to my right, the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persa Kelly. To her right, another familiar face, the state's epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tan. Great to have you back, Tina. Judy, as always, the guy to my left who needs no introduction, the Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan, Paramour Garg, and a cast of thousands. First thing, over the weekend, FEMA granted our request for a major disaster declaration for residents in Warren County who were impacted by the remnants of Hurricane Ida. This brings to 12, and you can see them on the screen, the number of counties where individual homeowners can now apply through FEMA for direct financial assistance to repair damages to their homes. The easiest way to get started is by visiting disasterassistance.gov. You can see that on the left there. FEMA has also opened disaster recovery centers across the state where homeowners can go to meet directly with FEMA uh, and their representatives to ask questions or start their application process. To find the center nearest you, please visit FEMA.gov and click Search Your Location from the homepage for locations and hours. We are committed to working in partnership with the Biden administration and FEMA and county and local governments and organizations to help every impacted New Jersey. And Pat will have more color on all of the above uh, in a few minutes. Moving on today, I am signing an executive order pertaining to all child care settings across our state. First, the order requires that all child care workers and facility employees be fully vaccinated by November 1st or face regular and weekly testing. This tracks with the requirements that we have put in place for health care workers, state employees, and educators and school workers. And the requirement includes full vaccination by November 1st, so that means a second dose by no later than October 17. The order also clarifies that the masking policies in all child care facilities must mirror those in schools. As recommended by the CDC, all employees, all students and children in a facility's care ages two and over, ages two and over, and all visitors must wear face masks with limited exceptions. Again, this brings us no joy, trust me, but it's the right thing to do. We appreciate that it may be difficult to keep very young kids in masks for the majority of the day, but we are looking for these settings to provide kids with as much support as necessary to ensure the safest possible environment. This part of the order takes effect this Friday, actually, September 24th. We know that there are already many child care providers who are doing their utmost to protect their children and their care, their employees and their communities, and we thank them. This order ensures that everyone is abiding by the same strong standards. Next up, this past Friday, the Federal Food and Drug Administration's Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee that rolls off your tongue, recommended that the FDA authorize booster shots for those ages 65 or older, or those who are at high risk of contracting COVID and who are six months or longer past their second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So those in these categories who were fully vaccinated by March. Now, there are a couple of important caveats on this one. First, we are awaiting final guidance from the CDC and FDA before we open the window for folks who qualify for a booster to get that shot. We anticipate this guidance in the coming days, I believe, Judy. Uh, in the meantime, we are continuing to prepare to push the additional doses necessary out through our vaccine distribution network. To administer these booster shots, we will be working through our existing partnerships with healthcare providers and community pharmacy partners, among others. A complete list of vaccination centers is available online at covid19.nj.gov slash finder. And also a reminder that only those who received the Pfizer vaccine are eligible for a booster. There is no approval for the mixing and matching of vaccines. The boosters are at this time only, again, for those who received the Pfizer vaccine. Judy will be able to provide a little bit more detail on this in a few minutes. But again, we're currently working to make sure that we have the supply ready to go once the CDC and FDA gives us their final booster guidance. And remember, that has, has been the case since mid-August. Folks who are immunocompromised are eligible and have been for the past month plus 
for a third dose. With that, let's review the latest data from Dr. Ed's team on vaccine breakthrough cases. The latest update includes all data through September 7th, which covers more than 5,375,000 fully vaccinated New Jerseyans. So everyone who completed their vaccination courses, whether it be the two-shot regime of Pfizer or Moderna or the one shot from J&J &J by August 24. So first thing, we are reporting a total of 22,246 individuals who have tested positive for COVID from among the close to 5.4 million folks in total. This is roughly four-tenths of 1% of those fully vaccinated. And given the efficacy rates of the vaccines coming out of their clinical trials, which topped at around 95% protection against the virus, the real-world results in our state are continuing to outperform those trials. But as we dig deeper, we continue to see the real power of these vaccines remains in keeping people out of the hospital, or worse, the morgue. As of September 7th, 457 fully vaccinated people, again out of nearly 5.4 million, were hospitalized due to COVID. That is 0.008%. And there have been 111 COVID-related deaths in total among fully vaccinated New Jerseyans, sadly. That is 0.002%. Now, here's the data specifically for August 30th to September 6th. And not surprisingly, this is still in the thick of the Delta fight. Not all of those 5.375 million uh, folks uh, who have, have been fully vaccinated uh, had to deal with the, the teeth of this variant uh, wave we're dealing with. But this recent uh, grouping, this recent collection of data does. And here I would point to the hospitalization and death figures in particular. Across the entirety of these eight days, our hospitals reported a total of 1,138 COVID positive admissions, and Dr. Ed's team counted 49 fully vaccinated individuals hospitalized due, due to COVID out of that total. Now, as was said before, this is a bit of apples and oranges given the differences in data sets, but these numbers are nonetheless very illustrative. So too are these numbers. For the period August 30th, to September 6th, Dr. Ed's team confirmed 127 deaths due to COVID-related complications. None of them at this time are from anyone who was fully vaccinated. We have been reviewing these numbers related to breakthrough cases now for about the past two months. There have been slight changes in the overall percentages, but they have been slight. Given the enormous increases in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, we've recorded as we've been under assault by the Delta variant, the fact that these changes have been slight speaks all the more to the power of the vaccines. I know that for some of you, there is nothing we can say, no number we can show that will ever convince you to get vaccinated. But for those who remain on the fence or who for whatever reason have put off getting vaccinated, take these numbers to heart and go out and get vaccinated immediately. Let's take a quick look at the rest of today's numbers. First, here are today's updated vaccination numbers. And here is today's update on newly reported cases. And you can see the rate of transmission has ticked up slightly as we had a few days last week with big positive test returns. So we need to focus on getting that back down again. Here are the numbers from our hospitals yesterday. We continue to see, Judy, a general leveling in our hospitalizations. But again, we have to start seeing these numbers decrease before we can feel we've exited this phase of the pandemic. And moreover, think of the tremendous healthcare workers who have been on the job since the pandemic started. You may not like wearing a mask. How about dealing with a pandemic for 18 months straight? So when you gripe about masking or vaccination, you're really showing you only care about you. The rest of us who have taken this seriously, who continue to take personal responsibility and precautions, who have gotten vaccinated, we are showing respect for our entire statewide family, including for the tremendous health care workers who have been on the front lines for far, far, far too long. And the reality is that the overwhelming number of those they are treating are in that first category, folks who are simply putting themselves before their families and communities. And sadly, here are the latest numbers 
of confirmed deaths. God bless them all. I believe all but one of those are in September, Judy, to the best of my recollection. And again, knowing the numbers we're seeing from the fully vaccinated, it is safe to assume that these are largely, if not exclusively, folks who are not fully vaccinated. A COVID-related death is a preventable death, and it is as simple as that. Now, as we do every day that we're together, let's honor the lives of those we have lost. Let's start here. On January 3rd, this guy, Boundbrook, lost one of its leading lights, 93-year-old John Betchy Jr., John was, as you can probably tell by that hat, a veteran of World War II, serving in intelligence and reconnaissance with the Army. It was part of the 24th Division that entered Japan. When he returned from the Pacific Theater, he married his wife, Christine, started a family, and settled in Boundbrook. Professionally, John was a masonry contractor, and he worked at the site of many of the buildings constructed in Boundbrook, including his own home. He also gave back to the community as a volunteer fireman, member of the American Legion Post 63, and president of the PTA, and through St. Joseph's Catholic Church, where he was a parishioner, among many other activities. John and Christine would have this month celebrated their 73rd wedding anniversary. John left Chris behind, along with his daughters, Jean, and her husband, Dwight, and Carol, and her husband, Ed, and I had the great honor last Wednesday of speaking with both Gene and Carol. He also left behind four grandsons, Brooks, Kyle, Shane, and Reese, and their spouses, and eight great-grandchildren, Mason, Capriana, Essex, Braxton, Carter, Sienna, Colton, and Emma. He's also survived by his sister, Gloria. We thank John for his service to our nation and to his community, and may God bless him watch over his memory and his family. Next, we'll move just a couple of towns over to Millstone Township, which was home to Richard Corvassi. And Richard was only 64 years old when he passed from COVID on January 5th. Born in Leicester, England, Richard grew up in Hazlitt, earned a degree in accounting from Trenton State College, now the College of New Jersey, and an MBA from Monmouth University. As a teenager, he took a job with Wakefern Foods, collecting shopping carts from the parking lot 42 years later, and two college degrees later, he was still with Wakefern, but now as the Corporate Director of Finance. What a story. Outside from work, he was an avid golfer and a New York Yankees fanatic who loved few things more than going to a few games a season with friends and trying to evade the TV cameras so his wife would not see uh, that how much that he was there or at least what ballpark food he was eating. Richard is survived by his wife, April, and I reached out to her last week along with his three children, Michael, Lauren, Eric. I had the great honor of speaking with Michael and Lauren and their spouses, his grandchildren, Isabella, Brady, August, and Gemma, and his stepchildren, Eddie and Lauren. He also left behind his father, Anthony Sr. Please keep him in your prayers, and his brothers, Anthony Jr. and Robert, and many nieces and nephews, we are honored to have called Richard part of our New Jersey family. May he rest in peace and may God watch over his memory and his family. And finally, for today, we honor North Plainfield's Carl Forrester, who passed the day after Christmas at the age of 74. A native of Plainfield, Carl earned a law degree and embarked on a 35-year career with the Veterans Administration in Newark, retiring in 2008 as a case adjudicator and appeals board member. As committed as he was to our veterans, he was just as committed to the youth in Union County, giving a total of 61 of those years to the Boy Scouts, both as a scout himself and as the longtime scoutmaster of Plainfield's Troop 5. For his service, he was duly awarded numerous district and national scouting honors and awards. A man of faith, Carl was also an active member of the United Presbyterian Church of Plainfield, serving as a deacon in multiple church leadership positions and on numerous church boards. Helen left behind his wife, Ellen, with whom I had the great honor of speaking last Wednesday, his children, son Chuck and daughter Leslie, and her husband, Bill, along with his grandchildren, William and Allison. He's also survived by his brother, Robert, numerous relatives-in-law, and multiple nieces and nephews and friends. Helen wanted me to say above all, that Carl was a man of humility. Uh, she wanted me to make sure I made that point, that he was humble. May God bless him, watch over Carl and his family, and we thank him 
for a life of service. Three more noteworthy lives from among the now more than 27,000 we have lost from our New Jersey family, and as always, we honor them all. Now, before I close, I want to give a quick shout out to that woman, Dr. Catherine Golfinopoulos, the owner of Paramus' AG Psychotherapy and Counseling Services. We know how hard this pandemic has been on the mental health of so many of our fellow New Jerseyans. And throughout this past 18 months, Dr. Catherine and her team have been there to help their individuals and families through these uncertain times, just as they have been there for many others across Bergen County living with challenges in their own lives. Thankfully, uh, Dr. Golfinopoulos partnered with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority to receive an emergency small business grant that allowed her to keep her doors open and phones and internet connected so she and her team could stay connected with their community. I had the great honor last Thursday of catching up with Dr. Golfinopoulos and to thank her for her continued support for those who have needed her and her team's help to keep moving forward in their lives. We are extraordinarily grateful for all they have done and continue to do. By the way, the rare business that has no website, but they have a phone number, and here's the phone number. Uh, main line is 201-291-4100, 201-291-4100. And with all that being said, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Uh, thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. The FDA's Vaccine and Related Biologic uh, Products Advisory Committee met on Friday to consider the approval of a Pfizer booster. After reviewing the data presented, the panel unanimously recommended an emergency use authorization to provide for a Pfizer booster dose at six months after the primary series uh, to Pfizer vaccine recipients who are 65 years or older or at high risk for severe COVID-19. The CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, will meet on September 22nd and September 23rd to offer further recommendations on the usage of Pfizer in this population. Following the issuance of ACIP's recommendation, the next step is for the CDC to accept those recommendations. The department will direct vaccination partners in the state to begin administering booster doses once ASIP and CDC provide further guidance. We will provide updates to the public once eligibility guidance is available. As we continue planning for the Pfizer booster, we are including the homebound population in these efforts. While many of the homebound received either J&J &J or Moderna vaccine, they will continue to be served by the provider who administered their initial series. Individuals can reach out directly to their local health department or complete the intake form available on COVID-19 Info Hub for homebound persons. To find the intake form, visit covid19.nj.gov slash homeboundvax. And for assistance completing the survey by phone, please call NJ COVID-19 Vaccine Call Center at 1-855-568-0545. In the meantime, we will continue our efforts to vaccinate as many individuals as possible, especially 12 to 17-year-olds, and also to remind people to get their second dose to ensure greater protection. As of today, 59% of the 12 to 17 year olds in our state have received at least one dose. We also continue to encourage those who are immunocompromised not to delay their third dose of Pfizer or Moderna. You can find a, vaccine, a vaccination site at covid19.nj.gov slash finder or by calling again 1-855-568-0545. So if you are immunocompromised, you can get a third dose. Moving on to my daily report, as the governor shared, our hospitals reported 1,137 hospitalizations of COVID-positive patients and PUIs. 57% of COVID patients in ICU today 
are on ventilators. That's one of the highest percentages that we've had. Fortunately, there are no new reports of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Our cumulative cases remain at 133. At the state veterans' homes, there are two new positive resident cases among residents of the Vineland home uh, since our last briefing. And at our psychiatric hospitals, there's one new case among a patient at Ann Klein. The daily percent positivity as of September 16th for New Jersey is 4.97%. The northern part of the state reports 3.94%. The central part of the state, 5.43%. And the southern part of the state, 6.60%. So that concludes my daily report. Please continue to stay safe and let's get vaccinated to protect ourselves, our family, friends, and most importantly, our children. Thank you. Judy, thank you as always. So the earliest we're gonna get guidance on the booster is Wednesday? Got it. So, folks, again, that's the what, what you saw on Friday was one hurdle, and we we're waiting to make sure we go through all the steps before we can hit, hit the, the go button. And you can imagine we're preparing, uh, we're, we're preparing in, intensely behind the scenes to have this teed up. Pat, I mentioned uh, Warren County was added, which we've been fight, fighting to get more counties. We're up to 12. Uh, so that's a good development in, inside of this tragedy. Uh, any more color on places where folks can go other than that disasterassistance.gov website, but any other color on FEMA or other related matters? Weather feels pretty good. We may have something toward the end of the week. Is that right? Yes, good sir. To have you. Thanks, Governor. Good afternoon. Yeah, we are expecting some rain Thursday into Friday, but as far as it being severe, uh, that does not seem to be the case at this point. Uh, with regard to disaster recovery centers, Morris County opened theirs today in Morris Plain. Essex County also opened today uh, at a West uh, Orange Kmart, which is co-located with a vaccination center. So we um, will see multiple benefits from there. I know the Warren County site is being assessed, uh, and that'll be identified this week, and, and where it will be built out is, is pending. There are two small business association sites, uh, recovery centers open, one in Gloucester, one in Bergen. There will also be one in Somerset uh, that opened up today, actually and our public assistance applicant briefings. That's where we sit and meet with all the impacted uh, counties and towns and build out their project worksheets for eligible reimbursements, whether that's debris management, emergency protective measure, measures, uh, bridges, roads, all of those things associated with the Stafford Act. Um, and I think I mentioned it last week, but uh, the joint field office where the federal and our OEM partners basically run the entire recovery effort with regards to not only the recovery but also mitigation efforts and plans, whether that's elevations, acquisitions, the various plans that we'll put in place with uh, DEP and, and partners from across the state. That's open, that's a 34,000 square foot location, uh, obviously keeping social distancing in mind. Um, and that has opened up, and uh, again, I've seen them in operation uh, for a long time, and it's phenomenal to watch that partnership come together and continue to, uh, to flourish as we recover from Ida. Thanks, Gov. Pat, thank you. That's in Mercer County, right? It is, East Windsor and Mercer, yes, sir. So that's, that's, not a, um, that's not a spot for individuals or small businesses to go to. That is the sort of, I would call it the wholesale coordinating um, location, which is great and physically in one place, obviously makes a world of difference. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to buzz through. Mike, we'll start with you over here. I think, is that Sarah with the mic? Nice to see you, Sarah. Um, we will be, uh, we're going to stay with the two a week cadence, at least till we get sufficiently through uh, and get a better sense of how school schools in particular have opened up anything else on the post-disaster relief and until we see start to see the Delta crest. I think we have the uh, Dr. Alan McMillan, I think, teed up for Wednesday for our first. Not sure that uh, Dan is telling me, but she'll be here with us soon to give us a sense of what school looks like here after the first few weeks. With that, Mike, we'll start with you. Good afternoon. And we'll be back here at 1 o'clock on, on Wednesday. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Governor, can you explain uh, why the mandate now for daycare centers? What information led to the decision today instead of, say, in August when a similar decision was made for teachers? Um, I wanted to ask a uh, follow-up on the post-mortem on the administration's handling of COVID. You, you said that something like that would be done. I'm curious if you have a timeline for when 
And do you think voters have ha should be able to see the results of such an investigation before the election this November? Or uh, now, I mean, ballots have gone out already even. And um, an unrelated question on, on the Afghanistan refugees. Could, could you give an update on, on how many folks are at the joint base uh, and what, if anything, the state is doing to help relocate them or assist them in any way? Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, no magic to today on daycare, but we had always said that we would start with the most exposed elements of uh, workforce clientele, uh, et cetera, and then, and then expand out from there. So we started with healthcare. We then went to educators, state workers, um, and we're going we're to chop, chop through communities as we see fit. Um, and this is something that was always on the cards. We just hadn't made the final call yet. We feel this is the right time to do it. No update on the, on the post-mortem, but we're committed to that, and that, that, that hasn't changed. Uh, part of the reason why there's no update is we're still uh, in the game. Uh, so we, we're, there's no, we're not to Monday morning yet, as it were. Uh, we're still in the fight. Um, and and, and what, the politics of it is of no interest to me, win, lose, or draw, but no update on that. On Afghan refugees, um, we'll probably at some point uh, sooner than later give a more comprehensive update on where we stand on that, but it's many thousands at the joint base. Um, we have been working intensely across the whole range of government. I'd say Judy and her team most importantly. Uh, and we have been doing everything we believe we can and should do to be a full partner. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's one of these processes that's not a straight line. Um, but um, now that the original waves have come in, I think it's our hope and my hope, and I suspect Judy and Pat, and Pat's been very involved in as well, we, we would expect to see um, a sort of more regular process um, as you get fewer new uh, arrivals. Uh, and, and Homeland Security, as I think is now public, has pointed to many hundreds who would be ultimately, they would, they would hope that New Jersey could ultimately take uh, of, the, of the population. And so that's very early stage. Um, and, but that's something that we feel is something that is both our obligation and responsibility. Uh, and we'll do everything we can uh, for the folks, m most of whom are here temporarily, and for the folks who ultimately end up staying here, we'll do everything we can to get them settled. Thank you for that. I do think a, a more comprehensive update at some point in the next couple of weeks makes sense. Dan, if you can help me remember that. Thank you. Daniel, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, so last May, you and neighboring governors announced you wanted more uh, personal protective equipment uh, produced in uh, your respective states. What's the status of that? Uh, how much more PPE is and other pieces of the supply chain are now being made in New Jersey? Uh, and what's in the way of those efforts progressing? Uh, what are the current stockpile levels? Uh, with the smaller eligibility for the, the Pfizer booster, uh, how many people in New Jersey are eligible for uh, the booster shots that stands? Uh, what does the infrastructure need to look like to administer booster shots for the smaller subset of the population? And how is that different from what had initially been proposed of, a, I think it was upwards of 2.4 million New Jerseyans? Uh, do any of the mega sites need to be reopened? Um, once the guidance comes out, what's the soonest anyone in the state could get a booster shot? Uh, uh, anecdotally, there's been reports around the country of people like lying to get a booster shot, uh, saying, uh, well, I guess, making up something so that they can get it. Is anything like that happened here? Do you advise against people doing that? Um, and uh, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have a, a, a PP update in terms of what's being produced or the stockpiles, but we can come back on that one. Let's do that. Uh, and we'll come back to you, Daniel, on that. Um, Judy, I'm going to say a few things here and then turn it over to you. In terms of the actual numbers, I don't have that number, but you may want. Do you have the number for Jersey? In terms of if it's 65 and up and... No, no time like the present. <laughs> um, uh, 65 plus individuals that received uh, Pfizer would be about 430,000. Uh, if you look at high risk individuals, if they move it to um, uh, 16 to 64 with underlying conditions, um, we're making an assumption that healthcare workers 
might be considered in that high-risk group, and that's just an assumption. Um, it could be as, as many as 1.1 um, million uh, immediately uh, um, eligible. Uh, we think it's going to be somewhat lower than that, but yeah. we're planning for the higher number, uh, and it will be a combination of existing outlets, uh, strong, active county sites, and probably one mega site to begin with, and then adding as we add more individuals. Does the 1.1 include the seniors? So yes. it's the 400,000 plus. That's the, the four. Yes, it yep. does. It's all in 1.1. So you answer the Daniel's other uh, questions as well, except for when. The when would be once we get the final go ahead, it will be immediately. Yeah. So it'll be immediately after the last uh, go ahead. Are there people lying to get the it's boost uh, either to get the third shot now or ultimately the booster? I'm sure there are some folks out there. Yes. But uh, two things. One is overwhelmingly no, and that's Jersey. People are doing the right thing and, and behaving responsibly. And secondly, at every step in the vaccination process, and I give Judy and, and her team and Pat a lot of credit here, when faced with the alternative to have more layers of bureaucracy and proof and all that versus just get the shots in the arms, they've taken door number two, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Thank you. Joey, is that you? Okay, how are you? Doing good, how are you? I'm good, thanks. What do you got? Um, so you all have been talking a lot about the eventuality of booster shots um, for 65 plus and high risk individuals, but it also seems like relatively soon there might be uh, shot eligibility for five to 11 year olds. I was just wondering about your planning for that, potential mandates in schools, how that will intersect with the booster shot program, all those kinds of questions. Um, I believe it was this morning, three uh, state legislators announced that they want an independent investigation into the flooding in Bound Brook um, and the New Jersey transit train that uh, helped cause it. Do you support an independent investigation? And then finally, Governor, um, you in your campaign and your administration have made your pro-choice uh, policies an important component. Um, and right now the chief discussion of that is happening in the, the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, do you support uh, Chief, or not Chief Justice, excuse me, Justice Stephen Breyer uh, stepping down while Democrats control uh, the federal government? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so on the 5 to 11, it's still a lot of rumors right now. I think we are pretty convinced whenever it comes, it'll be a different dose I believe this is right. Tina should weigh in if she sees this differently. As a result, that means it will have to go through its own distribution channel. Um, and I don't anticipate at this point changing any of the parameters we have around school. Uh, but please, hopefully safely and sooner than later, that, that we get that uh, approval and we can then go to the kids down to that level. Does that sound fair to you all? Getting some good nods to my right. Uh, uh, Pat, I assume you're good with that. Um, I, I haven't seen the, 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 the request for an independent investigation. Uh, we obviously want to make sure we know exactly what happened. I spoke to the mayor, uh, who's a really good guy, right after it happened. Uh, I know he wants to get to the bottom of it, and I can say on behalf of NJ Transit, we'll do everything we can to, to, to learn and figure out what happened, learn. I think NJ Transit did a lot of other related stuff but, uh, to, to mitigate, but uh, again, uh, that's where, where that is. And your last question, I can safely say, is way above my pay grade, but thank you for asking. Good to see you. Alex, how are you? Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Dr. Tan, setting aside the fact whether or not people are lying to get it, what would be the harm of a person simply getting a third dose of the vaccine with or without FDA approval, the vaccine safe, it's currently free? What would go wrong if somebody decided to just get a third dose on their own? Commissioner, does the high-risk population include prisoners in correctional facilities? And is it possible that these prisoners could be getting their vaccinations, their third shots before some folks who are walking around on the street are able to? And I'd, I also asked you this before, in regarding to schools, you said that in terms of discipline for kids who refuse to wear masks in schools, it's up to the district. How does that discipline work for kids or parents in childcare settings? And will you categorically rule out ever having an institution, childcare or school, called Child Protective Services on a parent because the kid won't wear a mask? 
For you, Colonel, can we have an update on the one missing person? Is that person still missing and what were the circumstances that person went missing under? For you, Governor, does the FDA's decision put a damper on your efforts to put these booster sites together? You were ready to go last week. Are you expecting to have resistance to getting these boosters out? It was tough enough to get two shots or in some cases one into people's arms. Do you expect it's going to be difficult with the third? And just generally, like Mike asked, how do you think that voters can make a decision on whether or not to reelect you without a full and independent review of your actions during the pandemic? And do you think you've made the right decisions? What's your pitch to voters? And is it fair they judge your response to COVID in deciding who to vote for? I love the way you ask your questions. Um, Tina, what could go wrong? These, these are good questions, all kidding aside. Uh, the, the first one, I mean, I, I, I would just say we, we play by the book, right? So we, we look to the feds who have done the overwhelming amount of research and the manufacturers of trials, et cetera, but help us with uh, why do we have to wait to make sure this is a go? Sure. You know, the FDA and the CDC, they have special advisory committees just in general to make sure that they have that independent review of all the data that are out there, particularly as it relates not only to um, how effective the vaccines might be or the recommendation for, say, a third dose or a booster, but also safety data. With that said, um, you know, as we had seen from the um, FDA advisory committee's review on Friday, that they did still have some concern that there was not a, enough information and data related to the safety um, for those, like, uh, you know, it, outside of those um, where there might be a benefit, 65 and older. An example that was cited relates to um, myocarditis uh, events that have been noticed. Myocardi myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart, and, you know, it could cause um, some significant um, um, uh, medical issues in individuals. And, it was, and we know right now, for example, that myocarditis, the likelihood of seeing more myocarditis cases um, are associated among young men, but particularly after the second dose. So, for example, is there enough data to support whether or not it's safe for looking at that particular condition? So that's why um, our committees, these advisory committees, look at as much data as they have, and they make recommendations to FDA, to CDC, based on what they have. Tina, thank you for that. Judy, in terms of uh, folks uh, in vulnerable settings, I assume we'll take the CDC's guidance on this. Right? Yeah, we'll primarily take the CDC guidance. We're hoping it'll be more expansive, so it's not going to be a situation of you know, either or, you know, one before another, as we did when we didn't have enough vaccine supply. But we do have supply, so we yeah. hope, and, and we're prepared to give it. So. We're going to hopefully have an expansive. Yeah, let's remember in settings like the one you asked about, it's a broader population than just the folks who are, are there for serving a, a sentence. It's, it's corrections officers, police officers, counselors, medical uh, personnel, and sadly, some of them have died and we'll memorialize them. Yeah, I don't, I don't, in, I'm, we, we probably take nothing off the table in terms of uh, dealing with a, a situation with a, a child or, or a district or a child care center. We're, we're expecting folks to do the right thing. Admittedly, in a child care setting, you don't have a district reality, right? So you can go to the district of, of town X and you know that you're having a conversation with someone who is responsible for that whole district. Daycare is clearly, child care is clearly a much more diffuse, atomized reality. So we just, we're going to rely on folks doing the right things. And we, they are regulated, so we have an opportunity to make sure they're regulated, and, and that includes from a health perspective. Pat, on the one uh, person who's missing, I'm glad Alex asked that because we haven't talked about that lately. It, it is my understanding that there is still one person missing, Alex. I've asked the SEOC for an update, so I might even have that by the time we're out yeah. of here today as far as circumstances in which uh, municipality they were from. Sadly, we do know when we got to the 30th loss of life, it was not from the missing list. That was someone who had been hospitalized. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of, I guess you asked two questions on this last one. The infrastructure, I think you've heard Judy refer to this in terms of where we expect to see the booster shots be available. Uh, again, this somewhat depends on the scope of the universe of people. If it's closer to 400,000 versus 1.1 million, there's a a, probably a different answer there, as you would expect. Will it be difficult? I think the fact of the matter is the fact of the matter is that you're already, by definition, dealing with a with a universe 
that's vaccinated. So the difficulty has been the hurdle from no vaccination to convince people to get vaccinated. And there's a block that, for whatever reason, are just not going to do it. But there's another block that we've been pounding away on who have a more legitimate reason. And that's why we're knocking on doors and doing all that we're doing. This group is 100 percent, by definition, vaccinated. So it should be a relatively straightforward exercise. Time will tell. Um, yeah, on the, on the politics, again, I, I don't have any, I, I, I want to, as always, keep that out of here. But I would say as we go up on the wire without a net, uh, somewhere between one to six or seven times a week, uh, de depending on how you look over the past 18 months, with a lot of data and a lot of analysis, including self-analysis on what's working, what's not working, I would say this very simply, again, no, no politics. We're among the most vaccinated states in America. We are the most vaccinated large state. And right now in our ICU beds, we have the smallest percentage of COVID patients of any state in America. Those are two facts, and we'll just leave it at that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, Governor Murphy, will you mandate vaccines for children five and up once the FDA grants full approval? I think we've already addressed that. The answer is we're going to deal with that population the same that we've dealt with uh, other, other communities. All right. For the health commissioner, how many children are currently hospitalized with COVID and what percentage of all new cases over the last few weeks are pediatric cases? Several districts have already closed schools or quarantined entire classrooms due to COVID outbreaks. But some say guidance isn't clear on what constitutes in-school transmission and what it would, might be, and that it might be more prevalent than reported. When should a classroom or a school close its doors? And when will you share more detailed information about those school outbreaks on the dashboard? Um, back to the governor. Has your office been in touch with the Biden administration about the number of Afghan evacuees that New Jersey resettlement agencies will help find homes for here? And finally, what is the state doing to protect IDA victims from price gouging and contractor fraud as they try to recover? So the, the uh, first one we answered, COVID kids, I've, as I recall, 24 pediatric cases right now, Judy. Does that sound right? 22. Um, and any, any color on, uh, I know we'll have Angelica sometime sooner than later, but from your perspective, a health perspective, um, how, how do you how do you answer that question of what's the level of certainty that it was an in-school transmission from an out-of-school transmission? And Tina should weigh here on this. When should and then when should therefore that school that classroom uh, take the step to, uh, to to close? Tina. So um, in-school transmission, um, you know, we, we have certain definition and criteria that we um, uh, utilize to define what an in-school transmission is. And so that's basically uh, when you have, um, we define an outbreak, an in-school tra um, in transmission outbreak to be um, three or more epidemiologically linked cases where, um, you know, you don't have any household contacts um, among them and that there might be some, um, you know, common activity uh, or contact among these. Um, you know, certainly, you know, we do recognize that there might be sporadic cases, you know, one-off cases in um, schools that might not, uh, that might just exist, you know, on its own. You know, you might have a classroom, uh, you know, where you have a individual who might have traveled recently and come back to school, for example, one individual, but there's no additional uh, transmission within the school. And, you know, we certainly recognize that those individual sporadic cases are also being followed up by the local health department's recommendations for containment and um, and uh, monitoring are typically taken as we um, typically do with any sort of COVID case. Judy, anything you want to add? Are you good? Thank you, Tina. Um, mentioned this, your last question, I think we've addressed, but we're on daily with the Biden administration uh, in one form or another period, and specifically of late with as it relates to Afghan refugees and the number that they are sort of putting out there as a uh, aspiration for ultimate, not just temporarily being in New Jersey as, they, as there are many thousands on the joint base, but ultimately resettling here is in the, in the hundreds, 500 and change is the number that at least that's where we are at the moment and we'll continue. We want to do our share and whether it's temporary or permanent and, and do, the right, do, the, do the right thing by these folks who stood by us. And that's the, the extent of the update. We got it now. Thank you for that. Ma'am, can we start, are you, is that Katie? Yes. How are you? Uh, good, how are you? I'm good, thank you. 
Uh, which mega site are you looking to reopen and when? And then when would a call be made on additional mega sites? Uh, after last week's announcement on school outbreaks and cases, the online dashboard has been blank. When will that be fixed and how frequently will it be updated? And will those updates include the list of schools who have had to go virtual because of COVID and specific information about the number of cases or quarantines related to school outbreaks? Thank you. Uh, I don't think we have the, do, do we have the mega site uh, answer yet? We're still working that through, right? Do you want to jump in? Um, I, I think the first one that will open yep. will be Gloucester. Yeah. But it's not, and it's not finalized yet till we know what we yep. need. And that was one of the one of the great ones we had uh, when we first started this. But again, this gets back. I know we've kind of we've said this several times, but it, you'll have to bear with us when the bid ask is four hundred thousand versus one point one million. We've got to figure out the the infrastructure has to follow that answer. I think there's a review of the of the dashboard this afternoon. I'm told, and that hopes to be up up and running in the next number of days in schools. And I think it will include the virtual question as well, right? We're, uh, we're just awaiting additional review yeah. of the dashboard uh, before it becomes publicly available. As always, we want to make sure we get it right, and it'll be sooner than later. Uh, and I think it'll include the information that you'd want. I think we're going to probably do it on a county basis, um, and, and which is historically what we had done. But if you see, once it's up, if you see any advice you have for us, we'll, we'll take it. Thank you. Dave, good afternoon. You'll take us home here. Hi, Governor. Hi. Um, with regard to the school situation, um, you know, some parents have been very concerned from the onset of the start of the school year and have argued for virtual uh, alternatives. Um, would it make sense to, to think about offering a virtual alternative separate from just each individual school figuring out their own plan to have a more planned out overview of this situation so that if a school has to close, you know, they can deal with it? Or also, do you think that this business with the school and the outbreaks, is this just something we're going to have to live with for the foreseeable future? Because um, who knows how long Delta and then, you know, what comes after Delta? Delta, we don't know. Um, with regard to the booster shot plan, will all of the locations, the dispensing locations that are currently uh, in existence, be offering the booster shots. I think, you know, Governor, you've said a couple of times it's more than 1,500 right now. And do we, would we anticipate that there would be appointments needed? Would these be walk-in centers? How do we think this is going to pan out? And um, Pfizer, as was mentioned, I, I believe, with the 5 to 11-year-olds, they're arguing now and have put forth um, their review and analysis that the um, shot is the vaccine is safe for these age group children. How much of a difference do we think having children ages 5 to 11 getting vaccinated, how much of a difference can that make? And then finally, with regard to the child care settings, um, any of us who have had kids, especially remembering when they were about two years old, we know that it's not very easy necessarily to um, convince a two-year-old to do anything. It isn't when they're 20 either. I'm That's also say. true, yes. A uh, different type of problem, though. Um, but specifically, you know, with the two-year-olds, I know girls tend to be more mature than boys, especially early on. I, you know, just to think of two-year-olds, you know, keep your mask on, that's going to be next to impossible in many situations, I would think. Um, realistically speaking, how are we going to deal with this, you know, I know you had said, Governor, we're counting on the parents to do the right thing, but in reality, this is going to be a problem, I would think. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Before we jump into your questions, Pat, and any on the missing person question? I do. Uh, technically, Alex, the state medical examiner office is still tracking one. That was a, a person reported in Nutley. Nutley Police has declared that as unfounded because it was based upon a witness statement. Uh, so we will have an official answer for you. But at this juncture, it sounds like it's tracking in a good direction and that uh, that report was unfounded, meaning that we probably most likely will have no uh, further missing persons. And I'll get that to you as soon as I have it. Thanks, Governor. Thanks, Pat. Um, I'd say your first question, two, two answers. One is... If this whole thing goes south on us in a big way, obviously the answer I'm about to give you 
ha we have to leave it on the table as an option to, to adjust the answer. Um, but assuming we believe that we can achieve the safe setting for kids, educators, staff, and we believe the package we put forward can achieve that, um, the option of learning loss associated with virtual learning is not an acceptable option. We have got to, assuming again, assuming we, we can be safe, we've got to keep kids uh, physically in, in, in person. And I'll give a non-medical, non-scientific answer. Is this something we're going to have to live with for the foreseeable future? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer has to be yes. Um, just as we've discussed different question, but just as we've discussed, Ed Lifshitz was with us several months ago, and we had that discussion on what a bad flu season looks like versus the rate of, uh, of mortality associated with this, and it looked like it was trending toward that level. It's now significantly above that, but that is a different way of saying I think this is going to be with us. Um, that's my opinion. I don't know how you all... To be determined on where you get the where you get the, the, the booster. We have six, well, I just checked it, I've got 1,658 locations right now. Not all of them are offering Pfizer, that's gonna be one big bright line, so it's Pfizer only. You had to, your first, your first uh, shots had to be Pfizer. Your, the booster will be approved, presumably, for Pfizer, so if you could bear with us on that one. But that will be a bright line, I would think, Judy, right? How much safer will we be if five to 11 year olds? I would think it's a big step. I would think, right? I mean, we're still pounding away on getting the 12 to 17-year-olds at a higher hit rate. They continue to lag uh, the, the state, but in fairness, they started later. They weren't, they weren't approved at the same time, so that's to be expected. Um, but it's got to be a, a, a big you know, incremental step in the right direction in terms of safety, I would think. I don't know. Again, I'm practicing without a license here, but so far I'm getting some good nods. Um, in a, yeah, I think you're, you've said it right on child care settings and two-year-olds. We're going to just, you know, there's some amount of habit that's already developed because they're, these kids are used to seeing. If they've got any muscle memory, they've been seeing mom and dad and maybe their older brother or sister wearing masks. Um, so it's not entirely from a standing start. Um, I mentioned that a lot of these child care centers are already uh, d you know, doing best practices, which is great. Um, and it's going to be, you know, we're going to have to do our best in here. I think all the, the premise of your question stands. And uh, again, the, I think there's a habit that's sort of in our midst that God willing, these kids are, are part of, a part of, they see it, they internalize it, and that we can bat at a better batting average than we otherwise would have if we were starting from a standing uh, start. You all good with that? Okay, I'm getting, continue to get nods. So thank you. Judy, Tina, as always, Pat, Paramel, Dan, Sarah, cast of thousands. Uh, we'll be again back with you live here, unless you hear otherwise, at 1 o'clock on Wednesday. Uh, and if we have anything either changed to that or anything that we need to get to you in, in between now and then, we'll go virtual or electronic or in some other format. You know, I just would say let's all continue which you've done by the millions, let's continue to do the right thing here. Please, please, please get vaccinated. Look to any, any guidance we set out about booster shots, possibly before we gather on Wednesday. I don't know what time they're meeting that day, but my gut tells me they're more later in the day uh, usually, so we'll probably have to uh, bear with each other. Get vaccinated, continue to do the right thing, and to each and every one of you who are doing all of the above, we can't thank you enough. God bless.